Thanks for the answer so far. And I'm very interested to hear that you want shorter balance sheets in the Netherlands. And that comment comes from the institution with the largest balance sheet within the whole Eurozone. In its ruling on the OMT program, the European Court of Justice has confirmed that the um, article which forbids monetary finance would de facto be violated if actions taken by the European Central Bank led to the indirect monetary financing. Put it differently, it is not only the letter of the statutes, but also the spirit of the statutes the ESCB has to adhere to. The court decided that such purchases may not be used to circumvent the objective of prohibiting the monetary financing of member states. Thus, when the ECB purchases government bonds on secondary markets, sufficient safeguards must be built into the intervention to ensure that the latter does not contravene the prohibition of monetary financing. The court was satisfied in the OMT case. It was satisfied because the ECB said that it would refrain from making any prior announcement concerning either its decisions to carry out such purchases or the volume it would purchase. But what happened in QE? The ECB announced exactly how much bonds would be bought each month and that purchases will last until December 2017 and maybe even after. Moreover, the European Central Bank has no intention to ever sell the bonds it already has bought and will buy in the future, having a stack of 2,500 billion euros on the balance sheet. The governing council of the bank has decided that sales are not expected to be normal practice in the foreseeable future. So if we put the QE program along the lines of the court decision, because we're trying to keep you exactly to your mandate, it seems that QE constitutes de facto monetary financing. Do you see that differently, or do you agree it's monetary financing? And do you have um, convincing legal advice that what you do is within the limits given by the mandate, Article 123 of the Article of the Functioning of the, um, uh, of the Market? Thank you. Um, let me give you two, first two short answers to your last questions. First of all, uh, it's not monetary financing, so I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. And second, we have uh, all the legal advice uh, we need to uh, prove ourselves and the rest of the Eurozone that that's not the case. That is not monetary financing. First of all, we, QE is in place for the objective of price stability. Second, the treaty and the statute of the ECB basically give the ECB discretion on which instruments to use in order to pursue price stability. This uh, treaty and statute provision was confirmed by the ECJ in its pronouncement on the OMT, where the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, said the ECB has, if I'm not mistaken, broad discretion in the use of its instruments. Fourth, the ECB, in deciding the QE, as well as uh, the time when we announced the OMT, had all precautions so as to make sure that we don't do monetary financing. Namely, we buy on the secondary market, we have issue and issuer's limits. So there is no case here. And, um, and that's it. Well, you say you only buy the secondary market, but you already announced what you buy the secondary market with a time lag of two weeks when these um, um, bonds are remitted. So the traders at the primary market know that after two weeks, they can come and sell them at your doorstep of the European Central Bank. That's circumventing um, the um, prohibition on doing it on the primary market. Second, you say you have a limit on the issue. That's why I asked my first question. The limit first was 25%, then it became 33%. And, well, the limit could also be 100%. Well, you couldn't go much beyond 100% of the outstanding debt because then you would sort of buy something which doesn't exist anymore unless you try some uh, derivatives. So you're going every time a step further 
away from a functioning market economy, taking huge risk. I mean, the Euro Dutch central banks took three billion already in a provision for if things go wrong, for instance, if interest rate rise. And you still believe that this is fully within the, um, the framework which you have and that you still are not doing any monetary financing, even though you've bought 2,500 billion euro of government debt um, by the end of the year? Yes, we do. <laughs> Uh, we do. I think we believe that our precautions have been, uh, have been put in place exactly to avoid this uh, danger. That issue limit has been moved upward, but still consistent with uh, what the collective action clauses in bonds foresee. So it's, and it's not been moved since then. It's not been moved since then. But still, uh, the, uh, I would recall what the European Court of Justice has said giving broad discretion to the ECB in what instruments to use in order to pursue price stability. Thank you. Well, but I mean, on the last part, you say, um, indeed, you have the collective action clause. If you have more than 33%, you can indeed block restructuring of, for instance, the government debt um, if it needs to. So if Italy needs to restructure and you hold 34%, you would have the very unfortunate position that the ECB could block the restructuring because it would lose uh, or want to do the restructuring and you're a political actor. But even if you have 32%, then you just need one other relatively small actor and you still have a veto power and you're an enormous political player in a necessary restructuring if the case comes up. How do you mitigate that problem if this case becomes true because the levels of debt are still rising in part of the Eurozone and if such a case uh, comes up, will you then look at the interest of the Eurozone or at the interest of the balance sheet of the European system of central banks? Thank you. Sorry for repeating, but we look at price stability, number one. Second, we have our mandate. Third, we have the treaty that says that we don't do monetary financing. Fourth, we are sure that the precautions we put in place are enough to avoid this risk. It doesn't seem like you want to answer my colleague, Antwerp. No, I've answered. Absolutely. Yes. But he was concerning the risk, whether you hit the, the percentage which he was talking I, about. You want me to say what we would do in case certain unrealistic hypotheses were to take place. I'm not going to say that. We don't want to speculate on things that have no probability of happening. Sorry? Period. Yes, sorry, yes. You say there is no probability that any, at any point in the future any of the national debts of the Eurozone countries has to be restructured? That's a zero probability event? No, no. We, we said no, no. I don't know about that. I don't want to speculate on that. We, we have decided the 33% limit. It's enough for the collective action clauses, and that's period. We are not going to speculate on the fact that if there is one that has 1%, we could do this and that. That's, frankly, speculation in which I don't think it would be right for us to spend time. But is it also speculation that one of the countries of the Eurozone at some point will need restructuring and that a large amount of debt stays within the European system of central banks for which the European taxpayers will foot the bill at the very end? So far, the taxpayer hasn't foot any bill. So this also, we, should, we may discuss this about the dangers of something that might happen. So far, what I see as a reality is that our monetary policy has supported the recovery in the Eurozone, has created four and a half million jobs which were not available before. That's what I see so far. That's the reality. The rest is speculation. <laughs>